All right, super. Thank you so much for that. Take your Bible and go to Matthew chapter 26. Look at verse 33, where the Bible says, Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Now, that's a pretty bold statement. The Bible says in verse 34, and Jesus uh, said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this night before the cock Thou shalt deny me thrice. And Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise, also the disciples, I listen to it now, also it says, said the, all the disciples. Now watch this. Uh, so all the disciples are coming together and they're following. One, you ever see this at a ball game? Somebody has a voice and they're shouting. And so because they're shouting, the same, uh, same in the bleachers, they begin to shout. And, and they might not know what they're shouting about, but they're shouting. You ever notice that? You ever notice that sometimes people get excite, excited because somebody else gets excited? You ever see that? You ever see different rallies that people have, marches that they're having around the country, and uh, one person's up there, they're speaking, and then uh, somebody over here uh, that is just listening, they begin to shout, and then uh, somebody else beside them, they begin to shout, and then somebody else beside them, they begin to shout. And before you know it, the whole crowd is shouting, but the speech, the segment of the speech that the first person started shouting about was gone about five minutes ago. You know, uh, this is what's happening here. Here Peter is saying with a very bold, boisterous, if I may say, type of voice. He said, look, Lord, I'll never deny thee. Matter of fact, I'd be willing to die for you. And the Lord comes back and the Lord tells him when he says, I'll not uh, deny, I'll not be offended at you. I'm not going to do that. Peter says, then the Lord comes back and says, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. He says, before that cock crows, he said, here's what's going to happen. You are going to deny me and you will deny me three times. Well, how is it that a person will be able to take and deny or uh, step away from that which is truth, and then, if you will please, embellish themselves in a lie or embellish themselves in something that is not sound doctrine? Or how is it that a person, if you will, uh, will continue a cycle and repeating the same mistake over and over again? I said this in my Sunday school class. Uh, people were amazed that uh, when we uh, traveled, uh, our children would all say, all, always say, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, uh, no, ma'am. And people would ask, especially my wife, how did you get them to do that? By the way, they still do that today. Just because you're an adult doesn't mean you should not also respect your parents. And uh, so they still do that today, uh, show great honor and things of that nature. Well, how did it get that way? My wife answered the question. It's called repetition repetition. We just train them over and over and over again. When we would call them, if they said, huh, uh, we said, we're not a huh, we're a, a yes ma'am, or we're a yes sir. And we train them over and over and over and over, and we would never let anything other than that be acceptable in our presence. Now, because of that, uh, they grew up learning how to show appreciation and learning how to show respect. Now, here Peter is. Peter is shouting. Uh, he's uh, coming across, I think, very, very boldly, and he's saying this. He said, Lord, I'll never deny I'd be willing to die for you. But yet he was so bold in what he was saying, I don't think he really thoroughly thought it through. Uh, because you see later on, he did deny, and he did deny, and he did deny. And by the way, uh, it would not be wrong for us to be bold in our stand, but can I tell you, it would be far better to be bold in your stand with a solid stand. Amen. Know that you can be what you say that you're going to be. I mean, step out and be bold as a soul winner, but also do the soul winning. You know, everybody, just like Peter, Peter made some mistakes here. And by the way, the longer you live, uh, the longer uh, you have a time to make mistakes in your life. Now, I'm not going to talk specifically about sin tonight, but I am going to talk about why is it that people repeat the same mistakes over and over and over again. And some of this you're going to see in the life of Peter. Statement number one, because of stubbornness. Because of stubbornness. Here's what the Bible says. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 33. The Bible says, Peter answered and said 
unto him. Uh, Though all, it says, men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. All right, he is very stubborn in what he is saying. Now, by the way, there's nothing wrong with being stubborn in the right way, but make sure that you have a right footing. Make sure you have Bible principles to go by. Make sure that you're not taking a stand in your pride. Make sure that you're not being someone, if you will please, that's going to do something that is wrong, that's going to lead you in a disastrous way. He said, I will not. Now, stubbornness is bad. Stubbornness is bad. Now, it's going to be stubborn, I said, in the right areas. But don't be stubborn in the wrong areas. Uh, Somebody says, well, I'm stubborn and uh, I'm just not going to attend church. That's the wrong area to be stubborn in. If you want to be stubborn, be stubborn in the area of I will attend church. You want to be stubborn, be stubborn in the area I will tithe. You want to be stubborn, be stubborn in the area that I will give an offering. You want to be stubborn, be stubborn in the area I will live for God. You want to be stubborn, be stubborn in the area I will go soul winning. You want to be stubborn, be stubborn in the area I will raise a godly family. Hey, let me give you some areas not to be stubborn in. I want to be stubborn and just look good. Can I tell you, your looks will change. It will happen. Uh, The older you get, the older. More your looks change. Uh, can I tell you, don't be stubborn just about your looks. Don't be stubborn because you're a hot shot ball player. Most hot shot ball players, as they get old, they don't play ball like they used to all the time. If I was going to be stubborn about something, I'd be stubborn in the way that I live for God. I'd be stubborn in my Bible reading. I'd be stubborn in my testimony. Uh, don't be stubborn in the way of always getting your way. Well, uh, you say as a child, boy, I just want to get my way, and I just, I, I, I just want to do what I want to do. No, God gave you a mom and daddy that loves you, a mom and dad that cares about you, a mom and dad that would give you godly counsel to try to direct you in the right way to go. There is places to be stubborn, and there is places not to be stubborn in. Don't be stubborn in the temporal things. Learn to be stubborn in the eternal things. It might be that uh, Peter was a little bit caught up in himself. Uh, Maybe he's saying that, hey, look, I'm just going to tell you, I will not. Now, maybe it was, I can't judge his heart, but maybe it was that uh, he wasn't a stubborn person to just say, well, I'm just not going to take and do this, but I'm going to do this. I don't know, but I do know this. I do know that you can be stubborn in the wrong areas and it can hurt you. You know, marriages are made to work together. Not one person say, well, I'm going to make it this way, and the other person say, I'm going to make it this way. No, you're supposed to harmonize. You're supposed to work together in serving Jesus Christ. I mean, there should be a goal in putting God first and making sure that if it's the wrong type of uh, stubbornness that you take and put that aside. Well, it might be because of pride. Look at it again. Watch this. The latter portion of Matthew chapter 26 and verse 33. He said, uh, yet will I never be offended. You know, uh, it's one thing to say, watch this. Here's the difference. It's one thing to say, I will never quit. It's another thing to say, by God's grace. I will never quit. See, one puts emphasis on the me. The other puts emphasis on the good grace of God. Can I tell you, it's by grace that you get saved, and it's by grace that you ought to live. It's by grace that God saved you, and it's by grace that you ought to obey him. Uh, Wait, I'm saying this. It might be because of pride. You know, uh, some people, uh, they indicate... uh, pride in their life because they never come to the point in the place where they say, I'm sorry. They never come to the point in the place where they say, I have sinned. They've never come to the point in the place where they say, I was wrong. You know, pride encourages us to keep up with the Joneses. I'm not talking about Brother and Mrs. Jones, it's members of her church either. But it encourages us to keep up with the Joneses. Uh, pride kills thankfulness. Pride is all about me. You're concerned about the way you are and the way that you stand instead of trying to be a servant and trying to help somebody else. You know, pride is wanting to run your own life. Pride has a hard time taking orders or seeking counsel from someone else. Pride produces a fake living. Uh, Pride entices us to try to be something that we are not. Uh, Psalm 10 and verse 4 of the Bible says, The wicked, it says, uh, through the uh, pride of his countenance will not seek after God. All right? And so because of pride, they don't even seek after God. 
Uh, Psalm 73 and verse 6, the Bible says, Therefore pride compasseth them about as a chain. And so what happens is a person that is proudful, it's all about them. You can tell the way they carry themselves. You can tell the way, yes, the way they dress. You can tell, uh, you, you, you ever see somebody and they, they wear the real tight shirts and, you know, they wear the real tight pants and, you know, why do they do stuff like that? Because they want the attention. You know, uh, we're not supposed to get the attention. We're supposed to divert the attention to Christ. It's not about us. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ is the one that deserves all the praise. And uh, by the way, you're not going to heaven because of you. You're going to heaven because of Christ. The Bible says over in Psalm 73 and verse 6, as I read it again, it says about this pride, it says, therefore pride compasseth them about. It, says, it doesn't say uh, as a, a golden ring or as something that is uh, splendorous. It doesn't say that. No, 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 no. It's talking about as a chain. So pride is something that just pe uh, keeps pulling a man down and pulling a man down and pulling him. You know, most men are not greatly used of God. You know why? Because there's thing called pride. Uh, how about you? Do you have pride? Let me give you a pride quiz. Are you ready? Are you easily offended? Are you easily offended? Take the pride quiz, uh, quiz tonight. Uh, does it irritate you when somebody else points out your faults or corrects you? Here's a question. When you do make mistakes, do you always make alibis? When you do make mistakes, do you always make alibis? Do you find it hard to receive instructions? Pride quiz. Do you find it hard to receive instructions? Do you mind being told what to do? Does it really bother you when somebody says, no, I'll tell you what, uh, here's the way this needs to be done. Pride quiz. You ready? Here it is. Do you get upset when somebody crosses your rights? When somebody enters into your rights, does it upset you? Here we go. Do you ever seek counsel because you realize you don't know it all? Do you ever seek counsel because you realize you don't know it all? Do you have a grateful spirit? When somebody gives you something, by the way, listen to me. If you're not grateful for the little things that God uses man to give you, God will never give you the bigger things. Somebody gives you French fries, hey, say thank you. Somebody gives you a Coke, say thank you. Uh, somebody gives you something that uh, maybe you could write them a note. Somebody gives you something, just write them a note. By the way, notes go a long way to show gratitude. Write them a note and say thank you for doing this. Never become an ingrate. Always be thankful. By the way, when you're thankful, here's what happens. When you're thankful, you're thankful this away. When you're proud, you're proud this away. See, a, a person that's proud, it's always about them. And I don't care who you are. I don't care what your educational status is. I don't care where you think you are in society. Everybody ought to have a thankful heart. Be thankful for everything. Uh, when's the last time you ever thanked your parents? Oh, they ain't done nothing for me, preacher. You're living in their home. You're eating their food. You're sleeping in their bed. Oh, that's my bed. Only because they bought it for you to sleep in. And probably when you get married, you'll buy your own. They'll be stuck with it. Now, I I'm saying this. You know, you've got a lot to be thankful for. Yeah, okay, you know, you can go to any household, and by the way, in any marriage, in any family, and pick it apart. You can. I've seen husbands pick their wives apart to the point that the wives don't want to spend any time with the husband. I've seen the wives pick their husbands apart uh, to the point that the husband never wants to go home. I've seen it. I've seen children that they can't wait till they get old enough to move out. Why? They've had it up to here. You know why? Because uh, nobody is working together nowadays. Nobody is trying to build uh, that which is gratefulness inside of the home. What if you just decided this? I do believe it would change your home. What if you just decided for one week... Take the challenge for one week. Instead of belly aching, instead of complaining, instead of finding fault, why don't you just take one solid week? I double dog dare you. Take one solid week and just be thankful for everything. 
You said, would it drive them crazy? You've already drove them crazy. Yeah, look, uh, reverse it the other way. You know, uh, instead of saying, uh, honey, let me tell you, you were five minutes late from work. Why don't you say, honey, thank you for being here tonight. When your wife prepares the meal, instead of saying, well, wait a minute, this wasn't, you didn't turn the potatoes enough. Why don't you say, honey, perfect potatoes. Amazing potatoes. You say, well, then uh, uh, I'd be lying. Okay, then don't lie about that. Uh, say something that's truthful. When's the last time you came in and say, honey, thank you for cleaning the house. Thank you that I didn't have to step over five piles of clothes in order to find the chair. Be thankful. Hey, we got a great church. Be thankful. You got nice pews to sit in. We have air condition. We got a good music program. Oh, hey, uh, be thankful. We got good Sunday school. Well, I tell you what, not all the Sunday school teachers are what they should be. Hey, look, neither are you. I'm saying this tonight. I'm saying have a grateful spirit. By the way, it's more caught than taught. So parents, if you want your kids to be grateful, they need to see the example. You be grateful to your husband. Husband, you be grateful to your wife. You, can I tell you this? Somebody said that the wife is the spirit of the home. I disagree. I think the husband and wife are the spirit of the home. Amen. How can two walk together lest they be agreed? Amen. You can have one rotten apple in a home and it ruins the whole spirit. Uh, and so you have to work together. Work together as a couple. Work together. Listen, try to bring. Look, be stubborn about some things. Be stubborn that you're going to have the right environment in the home. If you want to be proud about anything, be proud about the Lord Jesus Christ and what he's done for you. Uh, can I say this? Uh, you know, pride uh, ends. When pride's end comes, it's always shame. At the end of pride, it's always destruction. A, a proud man will get himself in trouble and never get out. Here's what the Bible says, Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 2. It says, when pride cometh, then cometh shame. But with the lowly is wisdom. Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 18, the Bible said, pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. So why is it that the circle is not unbroken when it comes to making mistake after mistake after mistake, sometimes because of stubbornness, sometimes because of pride, sometimes because of weakness, weakness. Here's what the Bible says. Uh, Matthew chapter 26 and verse 41, the Bible says, watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And so what happens is this. What happens is a person just decides that, hey, I'm going to try to do this, but they don't rely on the Lord. They don't ask the Lord to help them. And if you don't ask the Lord to help you, what happens is your flesh will eventually overtake you. The Bible says that in our flesh dwelleth no good thing. So inside of our flesh, you're not going to find. Even Paul said this. He said, the things I would do, I don't do. And the things that I don't want to do, I do. And he wrestled over and over and over again. That flesh will rise up. And you, you, if, if you want to be spiritual, if you really want to try and help somebody, if you really want to try to encourage somebody, you've got to make that a part of who you are. You have to put on Christ. That's what the Bible teaches. Put Christ on. You have to decide that you're going to take and be everything that you should be. And it's hard and it's difficult. But yes, by the grace of God, it can be done. Why? Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So my flesh never wants to go soul winning. Doesn't want to. No man seeketh after God. Your flesh doesn't want to serve God. Your flesh doesn't want to go to church. Your flesh doesn't want to tithe. Your flesh don't want to give offerings. Your flesh don't want to work a bus route. Your flesh don't want to teach a Sunday school class. Your flesh don't want to read the Bible. 
Your flesh don't want to pray. Your flesh don't want to be happy in church. Now, now by the way, let me help. The Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Yes. Can I tell you, if you're happy to be in church, sometimes you ought to tell your face. Amen. You know, when we have preachers up here and it looks like half the congregation's mad at him, that's not going to encourage his heart. You say, well, I got a tummy ache. Go get treatment. But you know, Brother Wells, I had a, a rough week and I'm just so tired. Okay, but listen, uh, uh, put on Christ and come to church and let God. Uh, are you going to be a better testimony and help to somebody if you smile than if you don't smile? Oh, you say, preacher, you know, you're telling me to smile and, and, and you ought not tell me to smile because I've just got to be me. You smile about things you want to smile about. I've watched some of you booger heads get excited about food. Man, I've watched some of you get excited about uh, uh, going to a ball game. These newly engaged couples, you know, man, they look at each other. It's like, you know, you know, and they're smiling at each other. These kids that just got married, man, they're doing, I mean, they're all about each other. You get happy if you want to get happy. Come on. I'm saying this tonight. I'm saying that uh, a person that does not break the, the, the circle of the mistakes might be because of stubbornness. Might be tonight because of that which is pride. It might be a weakness because you go back to it over and over and over again. The solution to that is what Paul said, I die daily. So what do you do, honestly? Is there a way to be able to break the circle I'm making the same mistake over and over again. You ready? Here it is. Number one, face the truth. Amen. Face the truth. Here's what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 34. The Bible says, and Jesus saith unto him, verily, verily, I say, uh, he says, verily, I put one too many verily's in there, but verily, I say unto thee, it says that this night before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. All right, wait a minute. And so he said, no, wait a minute, denial is coming. Uh, Peter saying, I'm not going to do it. Lord, I'll be, willing to, uh, I'll be willing not to deny you. I'll be willing to die for you. And the Lord is coming back and he's saying, not so. Uh, John chapter 14, verse 6, you hear it quoted every single Sunday morning. John chapter 14, verse 6, the Bible says, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Uh, emphasis here tonight on the word truth. Jesus Christ is the truth. Amen. You, you say, well, I tell you what, I, I, I'm just trying to uh, match up to what men are doing. Uh, I've got a better one for you. Why don't you match up to what tr uh, Christ wants you to do? If, if you try and compare yourself to men, here's what God says. Some comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Stand up, you two. Here we go. All right. You come here, please. You stay there. Here's what happens. I compare, I compare myself to him. Just compare myself to him. I try and get better, try and get better, try and get better. So one day I pass him. One day I pass him. One day I am in my own eyes. I'm better than he is. I made it. And then I find somebody else a little bit more loftier than I am. Seemingly a little bit more close to God than I am. Maybe they've got their life in order better than I do. So I compare myself and it annoys me, it annoys me, it annoys me, eats my lunch, eats my lunch, eats my lunch. I try hard, I try hard, I try hard. And then <laughs> I pass him. <laughs> but you say, hey, what if you pass everybody? Then what are you going to do? Then you're going to be frustrated with yourself with nobody to compare to. What if we did this? What if we did this? What if all of a sudden we had Christ as our example, we had the Bible as our example, we forget what he does, and we forget right. what he does, right. because after all, what he does and what right. he does is none of my business and what I do. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, oh, wow, I got a Bible. I may never match up to what God wants me to be, but God in his loving kindness will never give up on me. Amen. He will always love me, always accept me. Amen. He will always be encouraging me. Amen. Here's what we do. All of a sudden, uh, he falls down. Average Christian 
Well, you, you don't have to go all the way down. <laughs> but we'll kick him, we'll kick him, we'll kick him, spit on him, plea, and all that good stuff. Okay? <laughs> but now wait, Christ doesn't do that. What Christ does is he comes along, tries to help him up, brushes him off, <laughs> tries to help him. All right, now watch this. Okay, here I am. Watch this, okay? I need to face up. Thank you, be seated. I need to face up to that which is the truth. Who is the truth? Jesus Christ. So I decide this. I'm not going to try and compare myself to someone else because once I pass everybody, then I'm not challenged. What if I have somebody that's more perfect than anyone that's ever been or ever could be? I'll never pass them. But they will always inspire me to do more. Christ is always going to inspire me to pray more. To be more. To do more. Can I tell you this? And so here's what I do. I face the truth. Statement number two. Then I face a pattern. Look at it. I'm talking about how not to make the same mistakes. Get out of that circle making the same mistakes over and over again. What do you do? You face the truth. Statement number two. Face the pattern. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 74. The Bible says that he began to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man. And immediately the cock crew. And Peter remembered, listen to this, and Peter remembered the word of Jesus. Now, you do it once, it's called a mistake. You do it once, it's called sin. You do it twice, it's a copy. It's a copy. Uh, you do it three times, it becomes a pattern. So why not just decide that you'll put the right patterns in your life? Amen. Copy the Lord Jesus Christ. Put the right patterns in your life. Don't be that which is uh, 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 somebody that is uh, uh, known as a particular liar or a particular drinker or a particular cursor or somebody that is a particular thief and that's all you're known for. No, get the right patterns in your life. You know, once you sin and, and somebody sees it, it hurts you and them. Once somebody copies your sin, it hurts more people. Once people pattern their lives after you, it hurts multitudes of people. There's a reason to live for God. Your reputation does matter. What people know about truth can be evidenced through you. So you and I are supposed to be patterns. Patterns in small ways, patterns in big ways. By the way, uh, smoking is still a bad habit. It's a pattern. It's a bad habit. What do you do? You break it. You break it. Drinking liquor, it's a bad habit. Break it. You know, a person that's cursing, it's a bad habit. Cur Listen, uh, when I was in college, I used to, uh, man, I just didn't know. I just didn't know. I just didn't know. I, didn't, I got saved when I was 18. I was staunch Catholic. I mean, uh, altar boy, five years uh, you know, Latin speaking service Saturday evening, English speaking service in the morning time, I was devout. But as a Catholic, a Catholic that was unsaved, that is, I didn't know anything about the Bible. Nothing. I didn't know what curse words were. Now, thank God we have Christians that know better. Thank God for that. But I didn't come up that way. So I didn't know, what the, I didn't know that certain words were bad. When I went to Bible college and I would say certain words, can I tell you, I just did not know that they were bad. And then uh, one of my college teachers at Bible college, by the way, uh, had grace and worked with me and helped me and, and uh, trained me and poured his life into me and taught me how to read the Bible and taught me how to study the scriptures. And, and, uh, and David Lee had a hand in that when I first got saved, but the Bible college teacher even took it further than that. He became my Greek and Hebrew teacher. How about that one? But did you know that while I was in Bible college, uh, there was intense training in my life. It was like boot camp on steroids. I mean, God was just putting me through the mill. But as I was going through the mill, I was learning so very much about how to serve God and about how to stand for the things of right. But I still had that problem with that mouth. And so I'd say something and... Uh, he, he told me this. He said, use words that do not identify, not even derivatives. Don't use a derivative of a curse word. Use something that doesn't even identify with the curse word. He said, okay, next time that you hurt yourself, say sweet potato. 
sweet potato. What are you talking about? He said, you need sweetness in your life. Just say sweet potato. He said, practice it. Go ahead and say it. I said, this is silly. He said, say it. I said, this is stupid. He said, say it. And so, uh, you know, he had me say sweet potato. Well, you do, do you say that? You say sweet potato? Well, you are now. <laughs> How many of you are glad that tonight Brother Palmer is giving up cursing? Are you glad? <laughs> he said he is now. <laughs> I'm saying you break habits. You decide that you're going to break some bad habits in your life. Listen, uh, not tithing. That's a bad habit. Break it. Wearing immodest clothing, men and women. It's a bad habit. Break it. Long hair on men. By the way, Jesus never had long hair. Study your Bible. Break it. Lying and cheating. Break it. Stealing. Break it. Not going soul winning. Bad habit. Break it. Chewing tobacco, break it. Spitting it on your neighbor, break it. Using snuff, I don't know if people do that now, but break it. Taking drugs, break it. Cheating on your spouse, break it. Rebelling against your bad habit, don't rebel against your parents, break it. You have to decide that you're going to start new patterns in your life. You have to. Person says, I want to lose weight, and yet you still eat till 2 o'clock in the morning. You're never going to lose it that way. You have to break some things. I'm saying this. I'm saying uh, face the truth. Face the pattern. Statement number three. You face the mistake, the wrong, or the sin, and sorrow over it. You know how I can tell many times a person has a repentive spirit? Stay with me now. If their spirit is broken. When somebody makes a mistake... Are they sin? Are they broken? Are they driven? Not necessarily to tears, but to a broken heart, which many times will produce tears. Are they broken? How many times have you sinned against God and you came forward, got on your face in front of a holy God and said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You know, most people, when they sin, they cover up. But how many times have you faced people that you've sinned against and said, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have did that to you. Please forgive me. How many times have you done that? You will never have freedom. You will never have liberty. By the way, as friends in church, you ought to want to have good relationships with each other. Church ought not be a place where uh, you come and say, well, I don't get along with that person, so I'm going to sit over there. And I'm not going to walk over here to shake their hand because I'm staying in my terrain. The whole church ought to be your terrain. But what do you do? Here's what you do. You learn to forgive people. You learn to help them. You learn to encourage them. And if they come with a repentant spirit, you forgive them. You say, I think everybody in church ought to be perfect. Stop. What are you doing here then? There's not a person in this building tonight that's perfect. You look in the mirror and you'll see the greatest sinner that you've ever met in your life if you're real and you know you. Dale Moody was asked one day, said, who's the greatest sinner that you know? He said, every morning when I get up and I look in the mirror, I see him. You know what's the problem with fundamentalism is That nobody wants to see themselves as a sinner. Everybody wants to see themselves as a saint. And you say, well, preacher, we are saints because we're saved. We are saved sinners. That's why we're saints. But never lose the fact of where you came from. Well, I thank God tonight. Hey, God's delivered me. Thank God for that. I can rejoice, not in my own righteousness, but in the very righteousness of God. God's been good to me. God has delivered me. And because of that, God deserves all the glory. I'm saying this tonight. I'm saying you face the mistake, you face the wrong, you face the sin, and you sorrow over it. Look at it, Matthew chapter 26, verse 75. Here's what the Bible says. And Peter remembered it, says the word of Jesus. And he said unto him before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Now watch this. And he went out and he wept bitterly. Oh, you say, well, he wept because he got his hand caught in the cookie jar. 
He wept. I'm saying this. I'm saying the Holy Spirit sometimes, as far as a believer is concerned, here's what happens. They get under conviction, and they will weep and want to get right with God before man will ever come up and say that. Is your relationship that close? Here's what I find out. More and more as I meet Christians, they want to live their own lives the way they want to live their lives apart from Jesus Christ. Now, I love you, but what a shame. You're not supposed to be your master. He's supposed to be your master. You're not supposed to be in charge of you. He is supposed to be in charge of you. I'm simply supposed to be a servant serving the king. Not somebody's trying to impress somebody. Not somebody's trying to be a master of something. No, I'm simply a servant. You and I are supposed to be servants of him. Here's what happened. All of a sudden, Peter, uh, he went out and he wept bitterly when he remembered what the Lord had said. And let me say this and I'm done. How is it that you can break the circle of repeating the same mistake? You face the truth. You face a pattern, you face the mistake, the wrong, the sin, sorrow over it. You ready? Here we go. Uh, You face the fact in order to prevent it. You've got to decide not to do it again. Not to do it again. Oh, wait, here's Peter. 50 days, 50 days after he cursed, after he denied the Lord, after he denied the church, after he denied the faith, What's he do? He preaches on the day of Pentecost. So I wouldn't have chose him. Yeah, me neither. But don't you thank God, God is God. Amen. You know, the worst thing that you can ever do is once that you make a mistake, a wrong, or a sin, is to stay living in the sewer hole. That's the worst thing you could ever do. It's the worst thing you could ever do. I told the story not long ago about one of my brothers. We're out back. We're playing flashlight tag. Had some nephews over, cousins over. It was a great night. We owned a lot of acreage. Uh, and so, man, all the cousins came up. We were playing flashlight. And I, I remember one of my brothers saw a cat. And he liked cats. I don't know what was wrong with him. <laughs> but he liked cats. And, man, he went over. To try and, it wasn't a cat, it was a skunk. And I told him, don't you pick that thing up. And he said, oh, Mike, it's pretty. I said, it's going to purty you up. That's a skunk. <gasps> I said, back away slow. You're going to get sprayed. And I said, they're not going to let you in the house for two months. He backed away slow and he got, okay. But I'm saying this, I'm saying, worst thing you could ever do is live in your sewer hole. Worst thing you could ever do. You know, uh, best thing you could ever do, get thoroughly right with God, stay with me now, and thoroughly right with man. Then you get your prayers answered. Then God can work in your life. Then God can help you to have the home you ought to have. Isn't it amazing how God says this? He says, cease to do evil, learn to do good. So what do I do? How is it? preacher, that I can uh, break that circle, if you will, of repeating the same mistake over and over again. It's a learning process. Here's what I'm finding out. I'm 57. (sighs) But as I'm 57, you know what I find out? I'm still growing. I'm still growing. Every day I'm asking God for more wisdom. Every day I'm asking God for more of his power. Every day I'm asking God to guide me more. Oh, not because I want to become someone. No, I just want to please him. And the older you get, the more of a desire you'll have to please the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, when you lead X amount of people to Christ one year, the next year you say, God, would you permit me to show more people how to be saved? That's the way it is. When you preach... uh, uh, I, I know I, I've preached in churches where I'm running uh, on a Sunday morning 14, 15,000. And, and, and then you, you say, well, you know, what do you do when you go beyond that? Yeah, you tell me. 
You, you, honestly, you tell me. What do you do when you go beyond that? Are you doing it for you? So you can pat yourself on the back and say, wow. Are you doing it for him? See, somewhere in our life, we have to decide that we become dedicated Christians. Not because somebody's going to pat you on the back. Not because somebody's going to give you some type of reward. But because you truly, honestly, inside of your heart, you just love him. You just want to please him. And it's not so somebody can come up and say, well, I tell you what, man, you know, if, if I could. No, no, no. It's not about that. It's about loving the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And if we could get that inside of our hearts, and we could get that inside of our children's hearts, and help them to understand that it's about God, it's about Christ, it's about the Bible. That's what it's about. Then what happens is you start to lose all your pride. Then God can get all the honor and all the glory. You know, I've often thought, I'm not really, I'm not saying I'm dying tomorrow, so don't, don't edge this yet. But I've often thought what I'd want engraved on my tombstone. Have you ever thought about that? Probably not, because you're, you're like, you know, 14 and a half. And I thought if I could only put two words on my tombstone, what would it be? And I've almost come to reason that it'd be just two words. Only Christ. Only Christ. Because you see, if it wasn't for Christ, I wouldn't be saved. If it wasn't for Christ, I wouldn't have the beautiful wife I've got. If it wasn't for Christ, I wouldn't have the children I have. If it wasn't for Christ, I wouldn't have the grandkids I've got. If it wasn't for Christ, I, have not, I, I wouldn't be traveling uh, around the globe and training preachers and soul winners and starting independent Baptist churches. If it wasn't for Christ, I wouldn't have the friends that I have. If it wasn't for Christ, if it wasn't for Christ, I wouldn't be able to have a Bible. Wow. If it wasn't for Christ, I wouldn't be able to sing the songs that I sing and know the words to the song or fake it when I don't. <laughs> if it wasn't for Christ... See, only Christ ought to be your motto so that he gets all the honor and all the glory. Because I tell you what, it's a wonderful life if you just keep him first. Father, we thank you for tonight.